Well, welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about pneumonia, which is a pretty big topic today. Pneumonia is very common. So you do have to know about it, and you do see it quite a bit in the inpatient setting, and you also see it in the outpatient setting. Pneumonia globally affects about 450 million people a year. That's a, a huge amount of people. That's about 7% of the population. It turns out that out of those 450 million people who develop pneumonia, there's only about 4 million deaths. So we do treat these things, especially now with antibiotics, and specifically with vaccines, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Today, we're going to talk about the diagnosis, the symptoms, signs, and how we treat pneumonia, and some key things that may come up on tests that you'll be able to use for your advantage. Okay, so the first thing you got to know is what is a pneumonia. And as you know, the lungs kind of look like this. You've got the right upper lobe, you've got the right middle lobe, the right lower lobe, and the left side as well, and they branch off too. All of these things keep branching and branching and branching. Finally, what you're going to do is you're going to get to this part where you have these alveolar sacs. Okay, they look like little grapes. And that's where the air exchange occurs. So if you were to look at a cross section of that, here's the alveolar sac, and here is the blood vessel associated with that. What happens is this area gets filled up with infection and mucus and white blood cells. And so what happens is that the air coming in is not able to exchange and put oxygen into the red blood cells. Okay, so you've got an infection there. So what you should see is number one, you should see a fever, although not always. Number two, you should have an elevated white blood cell count. And then finally, number three, you should see an infiltrate on the x-ray. Well, the fever we get from taking the temperature, a WBC we get from ordering something called a complete blood count, and an infiltrate we get by ordering a chest x-ray. But what are the other signs that we'll see? Well, people will have fevers, will have chills. They will feel, if they're young, they're going to have pulmonary symptoms. So that's one thing that you should know is in the young population and in the old population, what do we see? In the young population, you're more likely to see things like shortness of breath, cough, in other words, respiratory symptoms, pain in the chest, okay? Whereas the old might just be confused, sleepy. So in other words, more nonspecific symptoms in the elderly population, whereas more respiratory specific in the younger population. Okay, the other thing that you've got to know that's just really important is where are these patients coming from. So there's something called community. And then there's something that's called healthcare acquired. The reason why this is important is because there are different bacteria that are associated with each of these. There's bacteria that's associated with the community which we'll talk about, and there's bacteria associated with healthcare, for instance, Pseudomonas and MRSA, which require completely different antibiotics. Generally speaking, the thing that's going to divide this is if the patient has come from a healthcare facility into your hospital, then it's going to be a healthcare-acquired infection. If, on the other hand, it's from a community, then they would be coming in from like from their home or from their apartment complex. If the patient is already admitted to the hospital and they're developing an infection in the lung after 72 hours, then that would be a healthcare acquired. Okay, so let's go through some key points here to kind of weed through this. So we've already decided that an infection in the lung is a pneumonia. Let's look at a little bit more of the history of the patient. Okay, so if you see a patient who has been bed-bound, 
I want you to think of a, an infection with Klebsiella. That's a Klebsiella pneumonia is a specific type of uh, bacteria. If your patient has COPD, then I want you to think of Haemophilus influenza. That's the classic one. Um, if the patient's been exposed to sheep in the field, then I want you to think about Q fever. Okay, these are associations that I want you to have. Um, if the patient is a bird handler, then I want you to think about psittacosis. Psittacosis is a condition that's associated with birds, chlamydia psittacosis. Um, if you are a hunter, specifically a rabbit hunter from Arkansas, but it could be any kind of hunter, I want you to think of tularemia. If there's something about bat caves in the question stem, then I want you to think about histoplasmosis. Okay, if the patient is in the Central Valley of California, or they mention something about California, the thing I want you to think about is coccidiomycosis, which is a fungus. And then if they mention something about Chicago or the Mississippi Valley, I want you to think of blastomycosis. Okay, so these are again, histories that you might get in the patients who are coming in with these symptoms that we've already talked about. Something else that you might see on history is the onset. Okay, if it's abrupt, think about typical pneumonia. That's typically what happens. If it, however, is insidious, I want you to think of atypical. Now, typical typically is um, an infection that comes on dramatically, it comes on fast, you have fevers, chills, and you're sick very quickly. Atypical, on the other hand, is not as severe, comes on gradually, and that type of onset is associated with different bacterial organisms, atypical organisms versus typical organisms. Now, the typical organism, as you'll know, is the streptococcal pneumoniae, and that one has actually gone down quite a bit in the last few years, and that's because of what's been going on with the vaccine. So let's talk about that a little bit. So there are two different vaccines in the United States that uh, we're using currently. It's the, uh, the polyvalent 23, which has been around for some time, and the Prevnar 13. Um, polyvalent 23 is also known as the PPSV23, and the Prevnar 13 is also known as PCV13. So the polyvalent 23, the thing you should know is that it uses a polysaccharide. And because of that, it's not a protein. Protein is what's required to make memory cells. So there's no memory cells here with the polysaccharide vaccine. It's currently FDA approved in the United States to be used in all adults who are 65 and older and for people who are two years or older and at high risk, or two plus and high risk. What do I mean by high risk? These are people who are high risk at having pneumococcal disease, such as people with sickle cell disease, HIV infection, or other conditions which can make them immunocompromised. Now, the PPSV23 or the polyvalent 23 is also recommended for people who are 19 plus to 64, okay, so before they get to 65 years of age, if they do a couple of things, if they smoke or if they have asthma, okay? So there still is a role for the polyvalent vaccine. Now, the Prevnar has a dipteroid protein in it. And what that means is you get memory cells. So that's pretty good. 
and it's currently recommended for all children younger than five years old. So from zero to five years of age and all adults 65 plus. And this has been a recent thing here in 2014 is that anyone 65 years or older uh, get it and people who are six to 64 if they have certain medical conditions. And what they found is that this Prevnar 13 has really done an amazing job at reducing the invasive pneumococcal rates. So they started looking at the prevalence of invasive pneumococcal disease in the United States, and they tracked it from 1997, and they wanted to see exactly what happened. So they looked at these kids who were less than five years of age, and they started around the 80 or so mark. And right as soon as PCV7, which is the, the forerunner, if you will, of the uh, Prenmar 13 came in, it's, things started to just dive in terms of the prevalence of invasive pneumococcal disease. So this was really encouraging because this was a protein-derived vaccine and it pretty much stayed low until finally Prenvar 13 was introduced back in 2009 in the pediatric population. It continued to decline. Now, interestingly enough, if you looked at the adults in the same category, they derived some, some benefits. So like in 2000, their rate started to go down and then kind of plateaued. And then when Prenvar 13 was introduced after 2009, they started to go down. And it wasn't until way out here in 2014 was it finally approved for them. And we're hoping that we'll see a even bigger decline. So it looks as though the decline in adults, adults over than 65 years of age, so the red here is greater than 65, and the blue is less than five, it looks as though there was some herd effect. So we talked about what pneumonia is, what the symptoms are, and some of the specific etiologies and how to tell them in the history. And then we went over a little bit about the vaccines for invasive pneumococcal disease. When we come back, we'll talk about the specific entities and how they look, again, with clinical findings. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.